Hello friends, my name is Satchel Like a Bag Drakes, and this time around we'll be looking at Chrono Cross. Stagnance is the enemy of creativity. Chrono Cross came out in a time when RPGs had an unshakably expected formula, an era when Japan ruled the western gaming market and defined the essential characteristics of a game for a generation of players. Before any wave of new philosophy would come to challenge our 40 hour RPG grind fest with beautiful cutscenes and do it yourself experience board games, there'd be a sequel to one of the most popular SNES RPGs that would bring a toolbox of new ideas. What made Chrono Trigger unique was the use of time travel. Trigger meddled with how traversing the same world in multiple periods might make a quest or a puzzle more interesting. Chrono Cross took the essence of time travel and approached it from a more personal, inverted perspective. What if the world you knew stayed the same, but continued on as if you didn't exist? You wake up as Surge, an eclectic dressed, funky haired native adolescent of Arnie Village. Arnie is a hobbiton of sorts, with a generally peaceful and self sufficient people who have an appreciation for nature, community, and merriment. In the beginning of Chrono Cross, Surge's potential love interest, Lena, tasks him with collecting Komodo dragon scales for a necklace she's making. You're inevitably sent on a quest looking for them, on which you discover a cosmic rift at a local beach that transports you to an alternate world. Right away, faint alterations to the world you know begin to surface. The monsters you once saw have changed. The inhabitants of your village have different goals and dreams. Your house is no longer your own, and no one seems to recognize you. Unfolding the foundation of a new story in the first few hours of anything can be very difficult. What made Chrono Cross so memorable was its ability to drive me into the plot in a timely and focused manner. Now, what I've shared thus far shouldn't impress you. In the beginning, all is well, and then something drastic happens. This message was nothing new to RPGs of that time. It's certainly not the universal act one, as titles like The Bouncer, Final Fantasy XIII, or Bastion start with turmoil, suspense, or hallucinatory climax. Chrono Cross reels you into Act 1 through using the gameplay tactic of menial fetch questing. Think about the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2. It was important you got to know Roxas, his friends, and his upbringing to relate to his sentiments with Organization 13. How did part of that happen? Terrible Act 1 fetch questing. But in Chrono Cross, Squaresoft does a better job at this because the fetch quests are a pivotal lead into the game's plot. Gazing into the ocean, Surge initiates a portal to an alternate world. The only difference in this new world is that Surge has been dead for almost seven years. For reasons unexplained until the latter acts of the title, your existence, or lack thereof, has an impact on events and political decisions that take place in each world. In a few words, your desire is to get back to the home and world you knew, without being captured by Lynx, a mysterious centeroid who is hungry for power. As the story of Chrono Cross develops, the player can't help but realize that they're part of something much bigger than themselves. It's more than Surge finding himself in a new world. The people he meets, out of a cast of 45, have pertinent needs that can progress the mainline narrative or branch out in a number of directions based on who he allies with. The humanistic beauty of this system is that through companionship and service, Surge finds himself. It makes playing this game feel very natural. These party building decisions can impact how other characters may treat Surge in the future. Some alliances open conversations that trigger decisions which can impact the future. Chrono Trigger diehards from the late 90s seared this title for having so many moving parts. The common concern was that providing a cast of 45 optional party members came at the cost of meaningful character development. I wouldn't demerit that call, but it assumes too much. It infers the apex of character development is found in deeply relating to all characters in a script. We have plenty of films that don't do that. The Avengers was a critically acclaimed team action film that ultimately proved to be the redemption and realization of Tony Stark. In other words, it's asking for Chrono Trigger. Chrono Cross valued a shifting story based on player agency. You don't witness the weight of decisions when you remove all the small moving parts and confine the story to five huddled characters. That would neuter this title's inventive qualities. Moreover, Surge and Kid were large gears in this title, and their significance wasn't downplayed.
Visually, we're looking at an environmental spectacle, and I'll explain why. Chrono Cross is a malleable story about a rift between two fully built parallel worlds. It challenges you to scour a continental map in search of key items and in search of yourself. As far as art direction is concerned, this practically demands creating areas that aren't only visually memorable, but aesthetically diverse. The world of Chrono Cross was created as such, allowing the eyes to be refreshed with vast, hand-painted, sparsely inspired landscapes and architecture. From barren deadlands, pulsing with lava and steam, to lush emerald phosphorescence glowing throughout an echoing valley. I've clocked a sizable amount of hours into resort marketing. Among the winter skiing getaways and the outback terrains, I spend the most time selling people on the ocean. Images of a vast blue ocean haven't ceased from enticing people to get away. The ocean shares a handful of poetic and contradictory characteristics. Referentially, it's a place for peace, reflection, and it could be more ambitiously viewed as a venue for self-discovery. It's also unpredictable, untamable, and all-consuming. My favorite theme of Chrono Cross is the ocean's place in transporting surge between worlds. It has its own divinity, and it's the pivotal mark of every landscape in this title. I could go on for an hour about the great influence Dragon Ball and Chrono Trigger artist Akira Toriyama had on the preliminary sketches and final models of these characters through Nobutero Yuki, or how diverse and vibrant it is to see such an array of costume designs ranging from peasant rags and medieval chainmail to racy leather and reinvention, uh, but it was definitely the higher level art direction choices that continued to influence my own work over the years. It isn't much of a question that the most universally praised aspect of Chrono Cross is its soundtrack. I liken its discourse to what Lady Gaga has been pulling off in her most recent albums. Musician Go Nakamura coined it as a musical Halloween, where every track from an album gets to put on a different costume from a different era, nationality, or subculture. Composer Yasunori Mitsuda brings an international and eclectic assortment of pieces and songs ranging from extended, orchestrated Celtic jigs to Western classical piano and guitar ballads to feudal Japanese and African percussion, all held together by a handful of resurgent musical themes. I don't want to overstate this. As I've grown older and made more friends who work in music, especially in composing original music for video game soundtracks, I've realized that a lot of what I enjoyed from Yasunori Mitsuda is really just what meets the requirements of a soundtrack. Recurring themes and diverse moods are nothing new and daring, and are just required for an OST. Game reviewers at large have a problem saying more than just this when tackling music, but I will say this. I've been following the same textbook of design practices for about five years, and that could change drastically at any moment, but the way in which I execute according to plan today is drastically more mature than the way in which I did so when I first started. Similarly, Mitsuda's seasoned direction fell nothing short of excellent in the way he delivered exactly what a soundtrack should deliver. Chrono Cross was Squaresoft's sweet spot battle system between Final Fantasy VI and Kingdom Hearts. Turn-based combat was an open invitation to tactics without the consequence of poor twitch timing and button combos, unless you're Zell or Sabin. As strategic as this is, the combat fragmentation sucked the creativity out of finding an in on your opponent like you might in a more live-action environment. Your turn is a choice between a strike of your weapon, a cast of magic, a buff, or a heal, and when you think about it, it's actually quite primitive that there's no means of maximizing your opportunity. Theoretically, gaining experience in-game makes it less costly to use a level 1 Thunder spell and grants the ability to use a more powerful level 3 Thundaga spell. Wouldn't it be logical that an experienced character could forego using that Thundaga and instead perform a weapon strike and a weaker thunder spell instead? Or heal a near-fatal character a little bit and get a jab in at the enemy? How does a battle system centered around tactics miss that? Kingdom Hearts hack and slash alternative naturally swings in the opposite direction, but doesn't provide an egalitarian solution. You can strategize in the moment, but that exact moment is a complete wildcard. This isn't bad. There are tons of good games like this. This is God of War, Devil May Cry, this is totally fine. What it stunts is the accessibility to a wide variety of skills. You can right left trigger the hell out of spell configurations, but from a UX standpoint, the moment you're digging into tertiary menus while joysticking and maneuvering your avatar around incoming attacks, you've created an awkward hybrid environment. Call me out if summoning mid-combat was fun for you. Chrono Cross was the first title at an early stage to present a happy medium. 
It forewent mana or MP conventions for a stamina system. Each turn granted the player with an amount of stamina that they could use creatively for whatever combination of actions they'd like. Instead of having a single attack action, the player was presented with a weak, medium, and strong attack. The weaker the attack is, the higher probability of it successfully landing, and every landed hit charged your ability to use powerful spells. Spells were tied to an element system, very similar to anyone who has played Pokemon. There's fire, water, grass, electricity, darkness, light, and so on. Each character has an innate element trait, which more or less makes them like a water type or a fire type. Because of this, Kid, being an innate red or fire element wielder, could cast all other elements perfectly fine, but had more powerful and special fire attacks. And the technical system of fire being weak to water, or grass being weak to fire, etc., is in place as well. This made things interesting with regards to Chrono Cross's field system. Essentially, every element casted had an effect on your battleground. Casting a dark attack would turn one third of the field dark, and if you chain three spells of the same element, you could turn the entire field effect into that element, which operates as a strength multiplier for all spells of said element. Towards endgame, having a full field effect also unlocks special overkill spells a character could use with the most epic casting scenes I've ever seen. Each character has three unique abilities, which spread across 45 characters totals 135 completely unique abilities crafted just for this title, not counting the common spells. This includes crossover abilities. As the narrative of Chrono Cross unfolded, particular characters shared strong alliances, and if they shared the same party, they could execute tag team attacks. At an early stage, Chrono Cross put a nail in the coffin with grinding so that the story progression and decision-oriented arcs could non-sacrificially play out in a timely manner. Random battles didn't exist, and leveling up didn't take place through gaining experience points from battle. Rather than throwing your general participation under an umbrella of general experience, growth was hinged upon what you actually did in battle. If you were heavy on spells, your magic increased, and if you relied heavily on your weapon, your strength increased, and so on. Your decisions made your class, rather than your class making your decisions. Chrono Cross was by definition innovative, meaning in a very closed and comparatively scarce bracket of JRPG games, this title brought in the least a combat system that existed nowhere else in quite the same capacity or level of popularity. At the time, resounding praise came from critics who noticed this. Scathing criticism came from critics who weren't interested in getting used to something new and felt that Chrono Cross may have been too heavy handed with reinvention. Both arguments seem fair, though I clearly err on one side. 1.5 million people were sold on this greatest hits title, and it received a 10 out of 10 on GameSpot, with nothing less than a 9 on any leading games criticism site at the time. Normally, I wouldn't cite these accolades considering how much heat corporate review outlets receive for compromised brand deals, but in the late 90s, this is all we had, and I'd like to believe that it was a slightly more sober industry back then. I'd like to. I think what swept Chrono Cross under the rug was what brought it so much hype in the first place. As a child, Adam Sessler told me that this was the sequel to Chrono Trigger. All the advertising surrounding this game pushed Chrono Cross as a more direct successor and continuation of Chrono Trigger than it actually was. I understand the disgruntled fans. I still had in my hands an amazing title, but I'm aware of how violently expectations can tarnish even the most flawless of titles. And really, it's fine. Chrono Cross came out at a time when games marketing wasn't held to a comparatively stringent level level of accountability. I'm mostly at a loss for words as to how much this title captivated a 12 year old me. I mean, maybe I was just dumb. It, it's up for grabs, nostalgia is in some divine calling, if anything it can serve as drunk goggles, but nonetheless I enjoyed it a great deal, never forgot about it, and it taught me a great deal about what video games can do to people, and I hope that you guys enjoyed me sharing a piece of my childhood. I, I wanted to cover something that I really enjoyed my favorite childhood game in reaction to 25,000 independent viewers and YouTube users who decided to subscribe to this channel and, you know, see see what future content would, would come down the road. I am so... I don't know. I, I'm. It gives me pause. I can't believe it, you know? Um, I'm so encouraged and um, I I'm encouraged that you guys are looking forward to seeing what comes down the road and um, I plan on continuing to put forward my best foot in, in making um, 
content that challenges me personally. Um, maybe content that challenges the viewer, you know what I mean? Um, and, and continuing this, this conversation about conveyance and w within the context of games, you know? Um, so seriously, if you have subscribed and, and you're interested, thanks so much for the encouragement. Thanks so much for wanting to stick around and walk with me. This really feels more than anything like a walk and the fact that you kind of want to participate in this, uh, in this surrogate internet kind of kind of pathways is is cool. Um, I'm really digging it, and this this I mean, like I've said in previous videos, this last year has been very different, and I definitely feel like I'm in good company to continue making uh, videos and continue trying to pursue what I view to to be excellence, and and to always be open to the definition of excellence changing or or becoming. Uh, something new or, or more difficult or more challenging for myself. So anyway, um, thank you guys so much. I hope you guys enjoyed this labor of love of sorts. Um, and uh, my name is Satchel Like a Bag Drakes. Stay humble. <laughs>